My name is Jerry Murdoch, and uh, I've been asked to introduce the panel and to help moderate the panel this afternoon. Um, in a statement of full disclosure, um, I am a uh, trustee of the uh, Aspen Center of Environmental Studies, where Chris Lane is our fabulous president and CEO. Um, I'm also a trustee of the Santa Fe Institute, where Dr. Brian Inquist is an external faculty member. And I'm also a trustee here of the Aspen Institute. I've been told rarely in life does one's personal passions and interests coincide, and rarely so precisely as it is this moment for me. So uh, I'm really excited about this. Uh, Dr. Enquist has had multiple awards from the National Science Foundation, other organizations, um, popular science, list of top 10 brilliant new scientists and young scientists. And tonight, today's work presentation is gonna have two really interesting things in his thing that I am very passionate about. The first is a database of forest assets, which to my knowledge has never been done before. And second is the model associated with that database and how it can be used to look at climate change and other environmental factors happening. So without further ado, uh, Brian, take it away. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Jerry. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I want to apologize in, in, in brief here that we're having some AV issues, um, so hopefully that won't detract too much, but the message, I think, should be pretty clear. But what I wanted to first uh, kind of like start with to kind of put the issue of climate change in perspective, especially as we think about biology and the, ro and the role of climate change, is uh, kind of highlight this one project that was just funded. This is the LSST. This is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. The goal then of this telescope is then to map every object within the night sky, every single object then within the night sky, and do it repeatedly and track you know, any sort of movement. This is the largest grant that the National Science Foundation awarded. It's a light item um, in the congressional budget in 2014. And not only will this uh, project track billions of, of, of remote galaxies, but hopefully identify impending doom coming from asteroids, comets, and so on, right? So what's interesting, if we turn our telescopes back to Earth, is that I do think it's time to mount a similar effort, but for planet Earth itself, in particular the biological side. So we don't know how many species there are on Earth. We don't know really where most of them live. We don't know how well they're gonna to respond to climate change, what will happen to them, and so on. So what I would like to do today is focus on our Western forests, okay? In particular, focus on the fate of Western forests. Forests are beautiful, okay? Forests also um, inspires uh, not only us to dream about big things, okay, but they're an important source for recreation, hunting, inspiration, relaxation, and so on. Forests also provide important ecosystem services. They store a lot of carbon. They actually take up a lot of carbon. They're a very important buffer in terms of the pace of climate change itself. Okay, so what I would like to do is transition a little bit to try to focus on what we can do to predict the fate and the health of our forests. We're going to focus mainly on the western United States, but I'm going to tell you that this process of going ahead and trying to forecast and predict what's going to happen to our western forests, we can also apply this at a global level. We can do this effectively for every plant species on Earth. So here's the reality. Okay? This is the choice. We have a choice of two possible climate futures ahead of us. Okay? These two possible climate futures are going to be manifest in the next approximate 100 years. Okay, not only well within your lifespan, but then your children's lifespan as well. So on the left, I have a best case scenario. Okay? This best case scenario is effectively a drastic reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. We can contrast that then with a worst case scenario, which effectively is business as usual and the continued increase in greenhouse gas emissions. Now these two plots then are showing you the change in the average surface temperature between effectively now until about 2100. So these two different worlds are quite dramatic in terms of the difference then in temperature. Okay, we're talking about a very dramatic rise in mean global temperature by the year, possible year of 2100. So then what do these different climate scenarios mean effectively for our forests? Okay, it's fine to have a picture of the globe and a kind of a jittery uh, picture here on temperature, but what does this physically mean for our forests, in particular our forests in the backyard? So what I'm showing you here is just a Google Earth shot of Aspen area. And I'm highlighting then two effective scenarios, okay, in terms of what then these two scenarios mean for the mean average temperature then here within the Aspen area. Currently, your January mean temperature is 34 degrees. 
your July high temperature on average is about 78.9 degrees. Under the best case scenario, if we get our act together and reduce climate uh, greenhouse gas emissions, those temperatures go up to 37 degrees in the winter and 82 degrees then in the summer. The worst case scenario, by the year 2100, the average then high temperature here is going to be effectively 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, a change from 78 degrees to 90 degrees and effectively the span of little over 70 to 80 years. Now, we've heard a lot about climate change, okay, not a lot has been done in terms of climate policy. So why the climate change paralysis? Well, there are many reasons, and I'm not here to talk about those reasons, but I want to focus on two things that when I talk to people, these are the two things that I think are critical barriers to communicating then science to effective policy. The first is the perception of, our per of how global climate change is going to impact us personally and on the scale at which we live. Okay, how is it going to influence me not only now, but say 10 years ago, 20 years from now? So the thought is that global climate change is global, right? It's going to be happening somewhere else. Someone else is going to have to deal with it. Maybe rising seawaters, maybe increased chance of storms. But it's hard really to fathom what that means for my life right here, right now. The other is the scientific scale of forecasts themselves. Okay? Instead of plotting mean temperature on a global map, what if we were able to make very detailed predictions in terms of what your backyard is going to look like? Okay? What your world is going to look like? Can we quantify what climate change policy means on human scales of perception? So what I would like to do is address one aspect of this climate change paralysis by developing a novel modeling framework effectively a model and tools then to forecast the impact of global climate change for your backyard. What does this mean 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now? So I'm going to introduce to you a big data informatics pipeline for us to utilize the world's botanical data to actually do uh, effectively big science. I'm going to also show you some forest simulation tools okay, that allow us then to visualize what climate change then means for our forests. And then we're going to apply this to then show how different climate change scenarios will then impact Western forests. Okay. Now, this project is effectively spearheaded by this collaboration with ACES here, the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies here uh, within Aspen, but also a place uh, called the iPlant Collaborative uh, at the University of Arizona, but also the Laboratory for Tree Ring Research that's also at the University of Arizona. So the first goal then of this project is to create a data integration and standardization pipeline. Basically, we want to take all the world's botanical data, suck it all together so that we can use it to make more detailed predictions about what's going to happen to plants, trees, forests in general. Okay. This is from a very long-standing collaboration with a lot of very brilliant scientists. These are ecologists, computer scientists, informaticians, plant taxonomists, all interested with the same goal of bringing together the world's botanical data. So what does this effectively entail? Okay, this entails a very large workflow of data coming from various different sources. Two major sources of data actually come from herbariums, okay? specimen data, okay? but also field surveys where ecologists go out and survey forests. They go ahead and survey then the local plots. And then we then are able to mash then all these data together with some standardization tools in order to do science. Okay, so that's the big picture. So what are we talking about in terms of data? Well, as of right now, we've been able to put together and standardize over 89 million observation records. These are 89 million observations where somebody had seen a plant, seen a tree, recorded a tree at some geographic location. Now, once we start putting together this enormous amount of data, we can really start doing some pretty high-powered science with it. And that's our second goal, is then to utilize then the world's botanical data to develop an automated species range and climate modeling pipeline. Once we know where species tend to occur, we then know the local climate, we know the local conditions, we can then use then that information to start then forecasting what the impacts of different climate change scenarios then will be. Well, how do we do this? Well, it's actually quite difficult computationally. It's straightforward to do it for a, maybe 1, 10, 15, maybe 50 species. But when you're starting to talk about 100,000 species or potentially 400, 500,000 species down in the globe, we have to put this in a high-performance computing environment. Okay, and so that's what we're doing, working with the University of Texas Advanced Computing Center to basically scale this up and do this big time. So what's the third goal? The third goal then is to develop simulation tools to then allow anybody to go in and see and visualize what these data then are telling us, what these forecasts then are telling us. 
So the proof of concept, what is the future of Western forests? Can we focus then around not only Aspen, but the Western United States to make some forecasts then of what's going to happen then to our forests? So we're gonna start with focusing on some of the dominant species around here, but then scale that up to about 100 dominant species across the West to see if we can do this. So watch this space for early release in 2014, www.forestforecast.org. One can access these tools, one can visualize then changes in ranges then through time, what's gonna to happen to the species. You can zoom in, this is within Google Earth, you can zoom in to your location, your backyard. You can watch to see how specific species that you may be interested in, okay, may be changing. Okay, so again, this is a Google Earth simulation platform and we've mainly focused to start on the Western uh, United States. Okay, the next aspect is actually teaming up with another visualization group. This is called Oterra. They originally started doing military simulations for um, any sort of um, any, uh, remote, remote operations where they wanna go in and try to visualize distant landscapes. Oterra was there to develop their own simu uh, simulation uh, planetary engine that basically allows you then to simulate real time any place then on the globe. So to give you an idea of the depth of these types of simulations, I'm gonna show you then a little clip it then from this more realistic end of, um, of, of visualization with our projected maps then of tree species where we then can start to simulate the placement based on the local climate of all individual tree species. So then we can start, we can go into any place then on Earth, okay, zoom in. And so here we're kind of targeting in right on Aspen. And so if you can see not only the Rocky Mountains, but you see these darker areas then around. Those darker areas are then the actual projected trees themselves coming from many, many different species, okay? We can then zoom in, and at this scale then we can start then to model then the placement of all individual trees, okay? And so I'm kind of zooming in, going in. Too bad it's, bad it's a little blurry. But as you can see, there's the placement of several individual trees there. We're over then, you know, looking Aspen. So what can we do with this, okay? What I would first like to do is step back and ask how these two different climate change scenarios, once we have these the, the, this, this modeling pipeline, once then we have then these visualization tools, let's focus then on a specific species in particular, subalpine fir, the dominant then conifer then that's in, in all the mountains then that surrounds you. So if we go then to our Google Earth then platform, okay, one can zoom in at any specific location. The idea here is that we could then go from present day out to 100 years, taking 10 time steps. So what I'm showing you, think of this as like the weather channel, okay? And uh, these different blobs then of green are different regions of suitability then for cell alpine fur. And we're gonna, gonna be gonna pacing through this at 10 year increments all the way to the year 2100, okay? So if we, once you kind of watch it for a while, what you'll find is that the range then of subalpine fir shrinks. This is one example, but this is pretty much typical for most tree species in the Western United States. The end story is that we're facing the potential collapse of a lot of our forests. So this is the worst case climate change scenario. This is business as usual. We don't control greenhouse gas emissions. This graph, I'm showing you two lines, the red line, the worst case scenario, the blue line, the best case scenario. What I'm doing is I'm plotting then the change in area from present day all the way to 2100, okay? Worst case scenario, we continue to see reduction in the ranges, effectively the elimination of suitable area for subalpine fir. The best case scenario, if we do then potentially get our act together in terms of controlling greenhouse gas emissions, by the year 2040, 2050, the reduction then of suitable area actually starts to then stabilize, okay? So the effect then of climate change policy is immediate in terms of influencing then the forecasted then decline of subalpine fir. We can do the same thing for Aspen, okay? But now I'm gonna zoom in really close and I'm gonna show you these same green blobs Think of this as the weather channel, right? So high, dark green, okay, means then high suitability then for aspen trees. So I'm gonna start present day, and we're gonna do the worst case climate change scenario. Here you can see aspen, here's, uh, let's see, aspen mountain, aspen highlands over here. We're then looking out into the drainage to Independence Pass. 
is I then go through it 10 years in increments. Okay, what you'll find is that then in the valley where you're sitting right now, you become increasingly more light green. That effectively means lower and lower and lower suitability then of the, your forecasted climate then for aspen trees. Okay? And so then by the year 2100, you're effectively losing most suitable area then for aspen trees. Okay? Effectively, 30, 40 years from now, you could be experiencing very large mortality, according then to these models, of most of the aspen then within the Roaring Fork Valley. And the only potential location where you may find them is in the highest elevations. But again, we see the same result. I'm showing you a graph, the reduction then in suitable area throughout the western United States for aspen trees, going from present day all the way then effectively um, uh, to about 70, 80 years from now. Blue line, greenhouse gas emissions begin to stabilize. We then see a stabilization then in terms of suitable area for aspen. Okay. Within our Terra framework, we can also do very similar kind of views. In particular here, I'm looking at effectively the entire state of Colorado. You can see the states of Utah, Wyoming, and Colorado. I've highlighted a few different cities. And what I can do is I can draw your attention to at least a few areas. The darker areas, that's forest. So we're modeling then the placement then of all species then that occur then within Colorado, all forest species. And then the darker areas there are forests. This is modern day simulated then vegetation. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to fast forward you about 100 years and show you what's going to happen in the worst case scenario. That's the worst case. So I'm going to toggle back and forth. And even with a blurry screen, you can see that certain areas in particular are going to lose a very large fraction then of their forested areas. We can do the same thing, okay? Looking at the Four Corners area, so we have Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona. Again, current distribution, okay? There's Phoenix, Albuquerque, Denver. I want to focus you on a few kind of focal points. Here's the best case scenario, best case climate change scenario in terms of the reduction in forested area. Now let's see the worst case scenario. Almost a complete obliteration then of forests then throughout the southwest, particular within the Mogollon Rim then of Arizona, throughout New Mexico, but also in western Colorado, including where you live right now. So these dramatic reductions in forested area will be seen by space. Okay? And the time frame is not that long. Here I'm going from 1980 to 2080. This is the predicted area of change. This is already the effects of past and recent climate change. The two lines, best case scenario, worst case scenario. Again, under the worst case scenario, we're going to see a continued reduction of forested area then without, uh, throughout then the western United States. Best case scenario, we're going to see reductions, but the stabilization will become pretty quick. Let me focus in on the Roaring Fork Valley. Okay? So, Let's put in a few place markers, aspen, snow mass, basalt, right? The darker areas, we're simulating then all forested species then that occur within this area. So the darker areas, okay, are forest. Let's see what it looks like in the best case scenario. I'm going to toggle a bit back and forth between the best case climate scenario in 2081 and the current distribution. What about the worst case scenario? Okay, I'll toggle between current, best, worst. Again, gradual reduction of forest. What about using the same simulation platform to look at aspen trees? So what I'm showing you is the same view, okay? But instead of looking at all forest species, I'm just picking out then aspen trees. And where aspen trees are then forecast then to, to grow, the best, the highest suitability environment. So you see these dark areas then suitable for aspen. Again, aspen, snow mass, and basalt. Let's go through best case scenario. Worst case scenario. Okay. Aspen, Populus tremuloides, part of this group of species that occur within subalpine sub forests. Okay. The largest reductions in forested area are going to be in subalpine forest. Okay. Basically, all the species that occur within around you right now. Now, what's actually fun within the Oterra framework is that we can take flights. You can fly around. You can simulate these future worlds. 
we can experience then actually what your backyard, your street address actually may look like. And so what we're doing, I uh, wish I had a sharper, this will be uh, hopefully then available online and you can see more, more crisp in terms of what these videos look like. So what I'm looking at here is actually right up on the ridge over there, I'm looking down toward Aspen. Here's, uh, let's see, there's Buttermilk Highlands and here's Aspen Mountain. So what we can do, we can take a kind of a, kind of a uh, quick flight in. And you can see the, not only the town there, but the placement of individual trees, right? And you can kind of zoom in, you can look at where your favorite tree species then tend to occur. Okay. Although it's a little blurry, what we can also do is we can do very similar flights. I can show you the same view, what our current forecast forest distributions should look like, but then in these different world scenarios, then effectively what your backyard will look like. You don't have to be uh, uh, squint too hard to notice that by the time of 2081 under the worst case climate change scenario, we're not actually predicting any tree species to be able, that are around right now to be able then to grow in the valley. So effectively by 2081, the valleys then are gonna be bare than a forest. All remaining forests will then be pushed up, okay, into higher elevations. I will tell you that those forests will be compositionally most likely quite different in terms of the types of species that will then do best there. Things like pinion pine, ponderosa pine, okay, these are forest species then that occur at lower elevations right now, but in the future, okay, will become quite dominant. Okay. So one last science slide here. What I'm showing you then is the change in area of several different biomes or habitats, okay? It's hard to make out the text right here, but I'm gonna walk you through it really quick. What I want you to notice, there's two graphs. This is time from 1980 all the way to 2081 on both graphs. This is the best case scenario, the worst case scenario. This one right here, if a line goes above the line, these are habitats or biomes that are gonna be increasing in area. These are then the species in these different biomes that are gonna be doing better. If the line is decreasing, then these are biomes or habitats, then they're gonna be decreasing over time. What's decreasing over time? Effectively, all different forested biomes or habitats, okay? Subalpine forests, forests in general, more arid forests, all be experiencing dramatic decreases. What I want you to uh, focus on, because this is a relative percentage scale, Subalpine fir forest could decrease by as much as 90% in area under the worst case climate change scenario. What's increasing? Species that inhabit deserts, shrublands, and really arid woodlands. Okay, so to conclude, so for the first time, we've actually been be able to tap then into the vast amount of botanical data and forestry then data Okay, that occurred then throughout the globe. We now have the technology and the data to not only integrate them, but then begin to visualize and then bring climate change forecasts more on a personal level. Effectively forecast what your view shed, what your landscape, what your backyard may look like under these different climate change scenarios. Now, we started with forests and tree species in the Western United States. Okay, we started as a proof of concept. We wanted to do this for about 100 different species. Okay. Now we have the ability to dramatically scale this up and to visualize what different climate change forecasts not only mean for our forests here in the Western US, but we could do this on continental and also planetary scales. So to conclude, the total cover of Western forests will change dramatically, but the pace and the amount of loss are gonna be dramatically influenced by the pace of greenhouse gas emissions. Even a little bit of reductions are gonna to lead to very significant effects down the road. So in the worst, worst case scenario, we could be talking in the Western United States of reduction of suitable climate space by up to 40% then of the Western US. Now that's 40% less biomass, okay, that can be stored, 40% less carbon that can be stored by, by, by forests, that's 40% less carbon that can be uptook then by forests. Effectively, we're losing 40% of our buffer already then to climate change. Best case scenario, if we get our act together and dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions, forested areas will still decrease by 10%. Okay, the carbon's already in the air, it's already happening. 
But climate policy in this case does make a very big difference. Now, higher elevation and what are subalpine fir forests are going to be especially hard hit. Okay? Now, if you want examples, okay, this is happening now. Drive over McClure Pass, okay? drive around here. I've already been noticing that the aspen clones up here are showing not only quite a bit of stress, but you're already seeing quite a bit of mortality. Okay, the past 10 years have experienced dramatic mortality of western forests. And unfortunately, it looks as if that will only continue if not increase. So what about future applications? So remember, the entire goal of this is that we're trying then to take the world's resources in terms of data, developing technology, developing then pipelines, and then having a modeling framework to then deliver then this information then to anybody. So what we're working on right now is developing smartphone apps, okay? And then basically the fact that your phone knows geographically where you are, we can deliver what plants are around you right now. We can give you a personalized species list. But then the idea is that we can also then go through and then give you what plant species will be there or will not then be there. Now, the baseline of information and the modeling framework that we have, I think, have tremendous implications for other aspects associated with the economy, in particular, the insurance industry, business industry, banking industry, in terms of wanting to know what effectively local properties are going to be like, what then different locations then will look like then within the very near future. So this ability to quantify and then illustrate then these changes of what actually could be then occurring in your backyard and having then a treasured landscapes bring climate, climate change that much more personal, okay? Brings it basically to you and what it means for where you live. So what are some of the next steps? So this is the Amazon rainforest, okay? So um, it is based arguably the lungs then of the earth, okay? In principle, we could scale this up Okay, to do this then for all species then within the Amazon. On a lighter note, if you're interested, we're going to release our first app actually in a few weeks. It's already at the iTunes store waiting then for, for uh, official approval. Um, we call it, to start with, Plantomatic. Okay, and what Plantomatic does is basically, based on current distributions of everything then that's around you, it gives you a species list of all the plants that are immediately nearby or are projected then to be then in your local environment in this current climate, okay? This will work in the Amazon basin. We've already tested it down there. It'll work on the top of mountains because it, you don't necessarily require a cell phone application. If you're interested in species, you can click on it. You can get images from herbaria. You can get images from, um, from many different other sources. But what we're really excited is to be able then to deliver a more personalized then view of what climate change then means to the plants in your backyard. And so what we're working on developing here is um, effectively, based on your given geographic location, give me then a list of species that will be here not only now, but 10 years, 50, 100 years then from now under different climate change uh, scenarios. It's also possible to give you a personalized view of maybe how then these different plant species then will change, okay, according to where you are right now. Okay, so I can see I'm right at the end of my time, so I wanted to say thank you very much. Um, for also sitting through a blurry presentation. Okay, it's much clearer on my screen. Um, but I will promise you that um, in terms of, of, of making uh, this video available, hopefully we'll use the original slides then associated with this. But there are several people to thank in particular. Um, if you can just flip, it, uh, flip my screen back, if possible. We can do it verbally. Verbally, okay, there we go. Um, this is my uh, crew at the University of Arizona, but also here at ACES. Uh, Jamie Cundiff um, was instrumental uh, quite a bit in getting this project started. Martha Nero uh, at the iPlant, and uh, several of my folks then uh, at the University of Arizona, um, but also quite a bit of project support, in particular from uh, Chris and Jerry, um, but also then through ACES as well. So thank you very much, and we'll, I guess we'll take questions. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Have a seat, Brian. Um, Chris, tell, me about, tell, us, tell us the audience and us about the collaboration between ACES and, and, and Dr. Enquist's work. Well, for <clears throat> great presentation, thank you. For several years, ACES has been working on forest health issues, um, and we've created a state of the forest report. We've created a forest health index. Um, we've created an animated short film on the state of our forests. And I knew when we went to the University of Arizona, and I walked in to uh, your building, and the building is shaped like a tree, and looks like bark on the outside, and the first thing you see 
when you walk in that building, is the oldest living thing in the history of things. Everybody know what that is? The oldest living thing in the history of things. Brian, you want to tell it's not them? It's me. Yeah, right. The bristlecone pine? Yeah, it's, it's a tree. So it's a tree, and it's a bristlecone pine. So I knew when we came in and saw that, we were at the right place to partner with, um, with Brian. Okay, and uh, are you, what specifically are you doing to, uh, with data? And to, are you providing data for the database and part of the simulation? Are you collaborating on the Health Forest Index? Can you uh, tell us about that? The Forest Health Index, which uh, is, is really a watershed basis model right now, a data portal that you can go to online at foresthealthindex.org. And um, that's going to give you a gauge of the health of our forest in this watershed. And the data that we've got that Jamie has put together that we pulled data from, that's been, some of the data has been sitting there for years and years not being used. Um, and we pulled it together and we fed that data to Brian. He's plugged it in his models that take the supercomputers and it's helped us on a regional level and it's helped Brian on the national level. Uh, Brian, is this the first time that we've created a database of the inventory of forest assets? Well, there, there have been a lot of uh, different attempts, okay? But what has really changed is that with the explosion of data then that are available, yeah. we now have access to so many more data sources now, which is a tremendous boon, okay, for, for scientists and biologists in particular, because now we can do things we never dreamed of doing. That is actually having a map of where everything tends to occur, okay? But also, we can then start doing things with those maps, okay? We can tend to find what, what areas of certain species are more abundant, what species are less abundant. And so what has really changed now is the need, because there's so much data, to have a formal way of integrating, sucking, standardizing, and kind of cleaning and massaging all of this data so that scientists then can, can use these data. And, and how accurate is the data? Say, if we want to look at a square kilometer here in Aspen, how accurate would that be? Well, it, it gets more accurate as, as, as we go on, as we obtain more and more data. But for the most part, you know, our projections of, of the current you know, distribution of species then that are here are pretty much dead on. Okay? You'll, you'll find effectively everything then that we're projecting you know, for current climates right now. Right. And our, our ability then to, our, our forecast our ability are, are, is only going to improve okay? as, we, as we start to bring online more algorithms, different ways of, of range forecasting and so on. And, and who can use this database, Chris? Is this something you're going to use in your educational efforts? Well, the, uh, the, the researchers and the applied scientists, I think there's always been a gap there. And ACES, what we do best is bridge that gap. And we, we make 120,000 education contacts a year. We're in schools. We're teaching adults on the mountains. So we tell the story. And that's what I think our strength is with working with Brian. And Brian, who do you hope uses the database? Could you explain that a little bit? Well, actually, what really gets me excited about this project is that, um, well, stepping back, there are a lot of scientists that use these big kind of data sources, everything from genomics, OK, to the medical profession. But what really excites me about this and the ability then to partner with ACES is that then we have a natural conduit to, uh, to do outreach, to do education, okay? And to um, start uh, you know, talking then with, with a group of people that aren't academics, okay? That have other needs you know, for these data. Um, and so that's what most excites me, Jerry. I mean, do you expect yeah. the general public to be able to use this? Um, yeah, actually, that's what we're, we're aiming for in terms of our smart, smartphone apps and uh, www.forestforecast.org. Yes, it's actually geared um, to the general public in terms of if you want to find a given tree species that you're interested in, if you want to see these different forecasts in terms of the best case scenario, the worst case scenario, and what it means, okay, within this Google Earth then framework, you can zoom into your backyard and you can watch then these projections then through time. Could I add to that, sure. Jerry? The, you know, with climate change, everybody's seen uh, or hears about a glacier melting, but hardly anybody's ever seen a glacier melting. Um, everyone's walked through a forest. Mm -hmm. So this is something, this is the kind of thing we need the public to become aware, and a forest is that tool to do it. Yeah, and unfortunately, trees go pretty slow. It's not as if you see them kind of like falling over and dying kind of like right away. The dynamics of forests are on different time scales to what we perceive. And that's part of the issue, okay? A lot of biology takes place on time scales that you can't necessarily perceive because you're busy in your life. And then all of a sudden you notice, oh yeah, didn't that tree just die? What this does is effectively kind of speed up then the natural cycles to enable you to see what the trajectories then are on a human time scale. Do you think the forest health has economic impact on communities around, that live around the forest and for the country overall? 
Well, I, I've got a quick answer that when a forest dies, that increases erosion, susceptibility to, to erosion, um, which can increase flooding, which can damage our water. And we saw this in Boulder just last year. And um, that's a result, direct result of, actually that was a catastrophic fire that occurred that caused that, but the catastrophic fire occurred because of increased mortality and making the trees more able to burn. Well, you bring up a great point, Chris. We didn't look at your model, you didn't talk about fire. How do you model fire in that model when you say, okay, here's the best case scenario, here's the worst case scenario, where yeah. does fire fit into that? Yeah, it, and it, human inter interaction. Yeah, no, it, it's a great question. I mean, modeling fire is, is very you know, complicated for one, and, and I have some brilliant colleagues at the University of Arizona that, that actually do that. But if you know then forecasted climate, and if you know forecasted species composition, all of those then feed in okay, to influence the probability then of fire. Okay? And so one thing that we're very much interested in is taking then this, this baseline of information that we have to actually try to do some more detailed kind of forecasts as well for probability you know, of fire, likelihood then of fire in terms of you know, higher, lower, and so on. Okay? But with the forecast of a very large fraction of western forests dying, okay, those dead trees, um, you know, can support quite a lot of fire, wildfire, okay? So I'm, uh, uh, it, it, the, the forecast in terms of what, you know, the probability then of fire, I think would only have to increase with the yeah. increase in mortality. In, in your current model today, you didn't talk about forest health specifically, but you can look at biodiversity, you can look at robustness. Are these things you can measure any part of the forest today with the model and, and look at forest health? Yeah, so, so, so forest health, there are many different you know, potential you know, definitions of what you mean you know, by forest health, but some immediate things that we can, we can kind of map out and show are where are the areas that are likely going to experience the largest rate of change, okay, in terms of going then from a climate that's currently suitable then for a given species or a set of species, then to climates then that are not going to be suitable then you know, for those species. Under then those conditions, uh, that's one definition then of health, of how fast you're moving away then from suitable habitat. Right. And, and can you describe how people in the scientific community can utilize this model? And you too, Chris, you can ask this for you too. <laughs> you want to take that one first? Oh, go for it. That okay. was yours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, there, uh, in, well, the quick answer is actually many, many different ways. Okay? So w within my lab group, I mean, we're very much interested in trying to understand what then controls which species then occur at different then parts of the landscape. Okay? And so from more of a, of a physiological and kind of like a functional then approach, this enables us to, for the first time, begin to ask why then do we see changes in species composition. You know, but other areas that, that we're um, I'm quite interested then in pursuing is mainly the ecosystem then the implications then for not only differences in species composition, but the changes then in plant species composition. What does it mean to go from a forest effectively then to a woodland, effectively then to a more arid environment? What are the ecosystem implications in terms of, of carbon storage, flux of carbon, but also of other nutrients then as well? Great. We, we're really almost out of time, but if you've got a question, please stand up. Someone will find you and give you a microphone. Just stand up if you have a question, uh, and uh, we'll probably have time for one or two, okay? So if you have one, get ready, stand up, please. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, my husband and I are proud owners of about 40 acres of uh, forest mm -hmm. um, in southeast Wisconsin. So we've noticed some changes too. The white oaks aren't as prevalent, and some scrub oaks are coming in. However, one of the things, and we all know about the beetle, and it wasn't cold enough to kill the beetle. And there's all the pines that are down in the woods. Mm -hmm. And Harris Sherman talked about that in his op-ed mm -hmm. about forest fires on the increase. Mm -hmm. Nobody's cleaning up the woods. Then we believe reforestation. And are you going to just let those hills just be naked and let the you know the mudslides and that? Mm -hmm. Or is there going to be a concerted effort? We had a social program that we were hearing about for young people. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong, because I think we did this in the 30s with the WPA, mm -hmm. where we took trees and put them in the ground. Mm -hmm. So we could sit there and do nothing, or we could try and plant the things for the future. Could I, could I, could I take sure. that? Sure. I mean, we, this is, I'm so glad you said this. This is something ACES has been working on for the last two years. 6,000 acres of the Hunter Smuggler, Hunter Creek area. Uh, we're working with the Forest Service and with other groups on the Hunter Smuggler Cooperative Plan, which is active restoration work being done. We finished the NEPA process, and that is moving forward. So we're hoping that we can't save the 6,000 acres. What we're hoping to do is use it as an educational um, model for, for the rest of the country. And 
one thing on ACE's agenda is that hopefully this one with informed citizenry, this will change the budgeting on a federal level towards what we need is that exactly the restoration work that you're talking about. Great. We have uh, another question. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk, first of all. And I thought you uh, hit on a really important issue, which is um, people's perception of these things. And you're trying to bring it to make it a little bit more understandable for people because we don't usually see things happen over 100 year periods. But I have two suggestions, one of which is probably sure. easy and you probably already have. One is, and it was actually alluded to by the prior question, that's um, build in a history because people are skeptical about models because they in contain certain assumptions. So if you build in, here's how it's already changed, you know, the, the yeah. things that we've already had. And the other is, though, that people might see this as a hopeless thing. Oh, look what's happening. We've got nothing to do about it. Is there any way to model in another thing? Like, here's how if X percent of people were to make some small behavioral change, that would change the forecast from the radical worst case scenario to a better case scenario. So like, if people, you know, um, drove hybrids, uh, went vegetarian, did this, that, the other thing, whatever it could be, and say like, oh, that would actually have this much impact. So people could actually perceive how their behavior can actually have an influence on this forecast instead of just seeing it as a, well, this is what's gonna happen. It might be horrible, it might only yeah. be slightly bad. Yeah, those are two great questions. And, and to, to answer the, the second one first, um, that was initially what we started out to do. Okay, we wanted then to, to give the option of, depending on, you know, if you wanted to classify your lifestyle choice, Okay, or if you wanted to have different types of you know climate policy kind of like entered in, like I mean if you wanted to go all the way from, you know, from being a vegetarian to a carnivore or other you know types of you know lifestyle choices, what then would be the impact of that okay on the landscape? And it's entirely possible to do that, and that's actually what got us really excited you know to start this. But that's effectively you know where where we're going. And then the first question I got so excited about the second one I forgot. Uh, Oh, the history, yes, yes. And uh, I wanted to include that in the talk, but I didn't have that much time. What we can do is basically do hind casting, okay? And that is actually going back, like back predicting. So over the last 10 years, okay, if not a little longer, there's been exceptional tree mortality happening in different parts then of the West. What we can then do is kind of like go back and then highlight based on the rates then of climate change already, where then are we predicting geographically to see rapid then changes? And we can overlay areas of mortality that have already been seen then with our maps of large projected decreases then in suitability. And the overlap is actually quite striking. Um, but that's something we're trying then to also write up you know, uh, you know, for future scientific work. But it's a great, great, great question. Great, well thank you all very much and thank you to the panel.